this talk is all about the far side of the moon and uh, is it just aliens is just a, a clickbait really just to try and get uh, people to uh, attend I guess uh, and because it's the far side I thought to include this uh, lovely cartoon from Gary Larson who had a, a cartoon series called the far side and he had seemed to focus quite a lot on cows and other things but uh, this, this one's quite a nice one so I included that as a uh, introduction to the far side. So uh, the near side we're all extremely familiar with. I'm sure quite a lot of you are more familiar with it uh, even than I. Uh, I've taken quite a few shots of it over the years, but uh, it's something that we all see. We won't see very much of it tonight. I think it's what, like 4% or something like that. Very tiny sliver of the moon tonight. So we're all very familiar with the, the near side and uh, you know we've obviously been there and we've touched it in various places. People have been there and brought bits of it back. So uh, we're all very familiar with that bit. The far side though, <clears throat> that's always been a mystery because it's always pointing away from us. So we never get to see really hardly any of the far side from the earth uh, just because it's uh, always pointing in the opposite direction. So this is uh, naturally somewhat of a, a mystery that we'd like to know, uh, cut into the chase. Uh, obviously we do know what's on the far side now, but like any good uh, conspiracy theory, uh, anything that's hidden and can't be seen uh, is obviously hiding something and uh, ripe for conspiracy theories. But the moon in general is uh, pretty uh, ripe for conspiracy theories. Uh, this was one of the early ones. Well, actually, this was too long ago, 2016, this was. Uh, but it's, it's in a similar vein of quite a lot of other things that, uh, you know, there's a giant alien castle seen on the moon. There it is. Uh, as we can all see, there's a Rapunzel-style castle there with uh, probably a princess with long flowing hair uh, cropping out of it. Here's a zoom in of it. Uh, clearly an alien artifact and probably a spy mission that's uh, looking down on us. If we do go back to uh, I think this is the 1980s, uh, if anybody remembers the Sunday Sport, a uh, bastion of um, high... Uh, uh, intellectual journalism, uh, and this is one of their headlines, the top one, please, I'm focusing on the top headline, uh, I don't know what else you're looking at, uh, but uh, they claim to have found a World War II bomber on the moon, uh, they also found a double-decker bus in Antarctica, uh, a London double-decker bus in Antarctica, that was another of their fabulous uh, headlines, and here it is, this is the World War II bomber that's clearly seen uh, uh, in the moon, but they had some very good technology uh, in those days. I think well, has got a date there, is it 83 or 88, something like that. Uh, but uh, they, they zoomed in and enhanced uh, this picture and got a, you know, a much, much better image for uh, publication. Here it is. Uh, we can see there how clearly that uh, the moon is harboring World War II bombers. And I'm willing to be corrected, but I think that's probably a B-17 uh, flying fortress, but it could be something else. Uh, of course, if you know the size of craters on the moon, uh, and that's probably one of the bigger ones, this probably has a, a wingspan of uh, several kilometers. So uh, there's, there's a little bit of a scale issue there. <clears throat> so very ripe for um, uh, conspiracy theories, so much so that uh, you know big Hollywood um, blockbuster films have also considered it might be a place to have things going on, uh, such as Transformers, Dark Side of the Moon, which I haven't seen. Uh, but even before that, uh, there was a great moon hoax in 1835. And this is that. Uh, it was uh, composed by the New York Sun. It must be something to do with newspapers called The Sun. Uh, and featured Sir John Herschel, although he didn't realize he was being featured. So in 1835, they suggested that Sir John Herschel, who was uh, uh, the son of uh, William Herschel and an astronomer, great astronomer in his own right, had got a brand new big telescope and he was now getting absolutely fabulous images of the moon and the inhabitants on there. And they seem to be sort of bear-like people with uh, wings and other things like that. Here's a few other images and claim to see them flying around. Uh, and they ran this over about a week, 
showing uh, you know all these new pictures of the moon that no doubt enthralled the uh, public and probably boosted circulation. So jo um, John Herschel at the that time was actually in South Africa mapping the southern skies, so he was completely oblivious to this. So that's probably how they managed to pull it off. So that's you know yet another of the moon hoaxes that uh, uh, we we can probably dispense with. And of course, the far side of the moon, anybody from uh, sort of my era of uh, music has probably owned this album, or if not, why not? Uh, the Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, rather classic album. And they do come clean at the end uh, that they say there is no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. This was um, sort of a, almost a throwaway line that they recorded from the doorman at Abbey Road, Jerry O'Driscoll, and they stuck various of his uh, uh, sort of bits of prose onto the album. And this, this appears right at the very end, just after the heartbeat fades out. So there is no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark, which is quite correct. So let's have a look at a bit of science, meanwhile. <coughs> Excuse me. So the formation our best model at the moment is that it starts with a bang that uh, a mars sized body crashes into the earth uh, called thea well uh, quite how they knew what it was uh, called i'm not sure so this is an animation of what probably happened uh, this has been subject to certain controversy because you have to hit the earth just right if you hit it sort of too full on it cracks the earth open and uh, th there's nothing left of it uh, if it hits it too finely, then it just sort of glances off and goes on and nothing much interesting happens. But if you hit it just right and you get all this ejected material into uh, orbit, we probably start with a few rings around us and then it sort of coalesces into a moon. And that does answer some questions as to why the moon's geology is very similar to the Earth. It's not the only theory for the way the uh, moon got created, because the moon is extremely large. Um, moon uh, in a sense for the size of the earth it's far bigger than any other moon relative to the planet so uh, you know that's that's one of the questions that are still unanswered now why do we only see one side of the moon and this is down to a phenomenon called tidal locking where uh, this happens with certain combinations of a large body and a small body uh, circling it if they get into just the right um, uh, sort of process, then one body will slow the other down and it will eventually just show one side of itself to us. This doesn't just happen with uh, the moon. It can happen with uh, oh, other moons around other planets. We thought for many years that it happened with Mercury, that Mercury was entirely locked to the sun. We now know that's not the case, although it is almost. And uh, certainly with exoplanets, we're fairly sure quite a few of those are tidally locked to their sun. And this makes for interesting um, ideas about life on those other planets. If they are all the time, one side of the planet is focused on the sun, it obviously gets a lot of radiation, a lot of heat. The other side freezes to uh, death. Uh, and in between that, you get uh, these violent winds, of course, from uh, the heated gas on one side going around to the cold side. So probably not a good place for life if you're tidally locked. Although there is obviously a thin rim that uh, if you put up a big wind break, you can probably survive in. And the reason you get this tidal locking is this rather distorted not to scale picture shows that the Earth pulls on the moon with its gravity and the Likewise, the moon pulls on the Earth. Uh, the moon raises tides twice a day, so it's it pulls. Uh, I don't know. Can you see? Uh, can you see a cursor? Body nod. Yes. Okay. So you get like a, a little raised lump of water this side, and one sort of equally and opposite on the other side. Uh, this doesn't happen with the moon, obviously, because the moon is doesn't have any water, but it does raise the. Um, uh, lunar surface somewhat. So if you have that situation, then uh, you get sort of this lump of stuff raised up. But as the moon tries to rotate, you then get a pull on it, uh, sort of trying to counteract that. It's a very small pull, but uh, 
the moon is not a particularly big body. It's about, uh, I think it's an 81st the weight of the Earth. So the Earth exerts quite a pull on that and gradually sort of puts a break on the rotation of the moon such that it it is still rotating, but it's now rotating synchronously with the Earth. So if you look at this picture here, there's the Earth uh, and Moon, not scale. But if you watch the Moon carefully, you will see it rotate as it goes round in orbit. But it's rotating exactly at the same rate as it's going round the Earth. So this is what we uh, mean by tidally locked. So you are only showing one face to the Earth because um, that's kind of where it's settled down to, and that's the least amount of energy needed to keep in that. Uh, but it's not the whole story because the Earth, um, rather the Moon going around the Earth is not in a perfect uh, circle, it's an elliptical orbit. So at some points of the uh, uh, orbit it has to move slightly faster to get around and at some points slightly slower. So right out on the left and the right it's moving a little slower than it is close in. So, and uh, meanwhile, the, the moon is rotating at a constant speed. You can't really speed up and slow down the rotation of the moon over 28 days that quickly. So at some points in the orbit, it's not quite, we're not quite seeing it overhead. This is called a uh, libration. I and mean, there's a nice illustration of that. This is also helped somewhat by the moon not being quite spinning exactly perpendicular on its axis. Uh, so. I'm hoping this comes out okay. Oops, no, it doesn't if I press the button too much. Uh, so this is a sort of composite image over 28 days. And see the, the shadows going across it as it goes through its lunar period. But you can also wobble and you see right on the very edge some craters. Uh, so this is the moon and lets you see if you're lucky and have clear skies all through the period about 60 percent of the moon so we can see a little bit of the far side of the moon but to see any more of that you really have to go into space and send something around the back side of the moon to actually see and it's taken a while to get to that stage and uh, there's quite a bit of history there so i'm going to flick through that uh, some of you may remember some of this. And the problem with going to the far side of the moon is actually getting the information back. Once you get around to the far side of the moon and you land something there, such as this uh, smiley face on the far side of the moon, you've now got a large amount of rock in between you and the uh, receiving station on the Earth. So radio waves won't typically go through rock, so you're not that far through rock. So you can't really communicate directly with the Earth, so you've got to think up some way of getting around this. Now there's a couple of ways you could do it, and the most obvious ones don't really work very well. Firstly, you could put a satellite somewhere like here, and you could then bounce signals from the thing that's landed on the moon onto the satellite. It could then relay them around the edge of the moon back to the Earth. But if you put it right out here, it's, uh, it's too far where I placed it too far to be in orbit around the moon so it actually falls into being in orbit around the earth and being in the orbit around the earth it uh, very soon wanders off from where you put it and goes off uh, around and disappears around to the other side of the earth and uh, isn't very much use so you can get a day or two out of that but uh, it very quickly goes wrong if on the other hand you put it much closer to the moon uh, Again, it doesn't stay where it's put. It will have to go into orbit to be stable. So it just keeps going round and round the moon. And you get uh, a chance to talk to your uh, person or uh, probe sitting on the moon, but only every so often. And then every so often you get the chance to talk to the Earth. So you have to store up information and then send it back again. And that's pretty easy to do these days, but uh, was certainly much harder to do when uh, 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 in the early days of exploration, when uh, you know, these they weren't quite powered by steam, but uh, they, they were very primitive electronics being used. Luckily, there are some places you could go that if you put something, it stays relatively stationary. So these points I've labeled are 
uh, Lagrange points. They're places where uh, the gravity of the two bodies conspire to sort of cancel each other out. So you might well see that position L1, that's Lagrange point one, is a good place because you've basically got the moon pulling on it one way and the earth pulling it on the other way. And they sort of cancel out at this point. So if you put stuff there, it sort of stays, broadly speaking, where you put it. So this would be a great place for a lunar hotel. Or, well, it wouldn't be a lunar hotel, but a, a stopping point on the way to the moon. You could park something there and it would always be in between the Earth and the moon and wouldn't keep wandering off. So L1 is a great place. L2 is another good place. This is good for communication satellites because you can put something way out there. It is quite a, uh, a distance out. And if you put the satellite there, it more or less stays there. L4 and L5 are also possibilities, I guess, but they're, they're actually a bit further around in the orbit than, uh, than I've drawn here. So they're a bit harder to, um, uh, you're, you're rather an oblique angle to the far side of the moon. There is also an L2, if you, uh, sorry, L3, if you were just wondering where that is, and that's on the other side of the Earth. These positions also occur, well, between any two large bodies, so they also occur between the Earth and the Sun, uh, and we've made much use of those. So uh, there you can see L3 in this case. So for the Earth-Sun system, L1 is a really good place to put solar telescopes, and there are a number of them parked there because they just sit there and you can, they can see the Sun. Uh, they're out of the Earth's atmosphere and all that, but they stay there and you can always talk to them from the Earth because they, they sit where you left them. L2 is very popular place for um, space telescopes, uh, not for the Hubble, but for a lot of other space telescopes. Herschel, um, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going there. That's where Planck was. Uh, I think Euclid is going there. It's, it's just a great place because you're shaded uh, from the sun largely, or at least somewhat by the earth. You, uh, you're a long way out of the atmosphere. You can see there you're also quite a long way past the moon, so it's it's quite a tricky place to get to. It's not the sort of place you can go and service something. Uh, so very, very popular place for putting space telescopes. L4 and L5 are also good for solar observing because you can sort of see almost two sides of the sun at once, and L3 is pretty useless. Uh, we haven't found any use for anything at L3. <coughs> I mean, you, you would be able to see the far side of the sun, but you wouldn't be able to talk to it because the sun would be in the way. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice place, but uh, nobody wants to visit. So going back to exploring, how did we get on? Well, the very first probe to go anywhere near the moon was a Luna 1. This was a Russian probe in 1959 and was actually designed to hit the moon, but it missed. But uh, it wasn't too bad for the, you know, the first lunar probe. Uh, so it did get within sort of uh, almost touching distance of the moon, but missed. So that was the very first probe to get anywhere within the, the uh, moon's realm, basically. This was followed up by Luna 2, uh, much the same sort of design. And this one did hit the, the moon. So this was the first thing to actually touch the moon of any sort. Obviously, it touched on the near side because... Uh, baby steps, let's try the easy things first. So that was Luna 2 in 1959. Followed up by Luna 3, uh, which did get round to the far side of the moon, and we get the first picture of the far side of the moon. Very, very grainy, but uh, a triumph nonetheless. And they did make quite a lot of publicity from this. This was again the Russian mission. They did publish Atlas of the far side of the moon, uh, which um, it's rather stretching uh, the amount of information they got back, but they did at least uh, get, can say they were the first, they the first people to get uh, pictures of the far side of the moon and actually see what was there. Obviously, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you can see all sorts of uh, alien spacecraft there. You can see anything you like, really, uh, in such pictures. The next uh, one to take much better pictures of it was another Russian spacecraft called Zon 3. This was uh, intended to go to Mars uh, and sort of did. 
in the sense that it went to where Mars was, but Mars wasn't there when it got there. Uh, it was delayed in launching, so uh, it, it was uh, like a month or two late in launching. So it got, went on its original mission, went out to where Mars was, but Mars had moved on by that time. But on its way out, it went past the far side of the uh, moon. So we got some uh, much better pictures of that. Uh, it took 25 reasonably good resolution pictures of that. Uh, and we can sort of start to see some of the imagery of the far side of the moon. And you can perhaps even tell from this one uh, that it's somewhat different to the near side. We're already not really seeing the big seas that you can see on the near side of the moon. Uh, you can see plenty of craters. Uh, there could be hidden detail within there, but uh, cutting a long story short, there isn't really. There isn't really the, the seas or the maria that we see on the near side present on the far side. And uh, that's a puzzle we still have today. Of course, uh, if you're a conspiracy theorist, any small artifact in the, uh, um, the pictures will uh, uh, let you know that there's something weird going on there. This could be a, easily a sequence of black monoliths spread across the uh, surface of the moon waiting for Stanley Kubrick to go and visit it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, by now, the uh, Americans really thought they ought to get into the game of uh, exploring the moon, all the early running it done by, by the Russians. So this was Ranger 4, uh, part of their Ranger program. Ranger 3 landed on the near side, and I think, was that Apollo 12 that uh, picked up a bit of it? Because they, they landed nearby. Ranger 4 went to the far side, and as far as we know, it did go to the far side. Unfortunately, uh, it failed very quickly after leaving orbit, and the solar panels didn't deploy. Um, so it was going to do a heavy land with a seismometer, but as far as we know, it crashed into the far side of the moon, but as all contact with it was lost, and nobody quite knows where to look to find it. Um, we have no idea whether it actually made it or not. So that's, that's quite a common feature of early missions to the moon. Uh, right, then Luna 9. This was the first soft landing on the moon. So this one got to the moon and managed to, rather than just impact into it, uh, make a reasonably soft landing and uh, send back data from the near side of the moon yet again. But this was the first vehicle to actually land in a controlled way on the moon. So. Uh, Yet again, another Russian um, uh, first. And they followed it up also with Luna 10, which was the first uh, satellite to go into orbit around the moon and stay within orbit. Um, this did quite a lot of good science, found uh, things called mass cons, which became important for the Lu uh, Apollo missions later, and uh, had an interesting history. You can go and look that one up if you're interested. Uh, now, say so the Russia, the US had been falling a long way behind at this point, and the Apollo missions were coming up very quickly. So we all know Apollo 11 is coming up in uh, 1969 uh, from our vantage point of history. So they really needed very good maps of the moon by this point. So they had these range of probes called Lunar Orbiter 1 to 5, launched from 1966 to 67, to go and make reasonably high resolution maps of the moon. And these were all based on spy technology, spy satellites of the time that they were using to observe Russian troop movements and missiles and all that sort of thing. So they're using very similar technology here for mapping the moon. And they covered about 90 something percent of the moon with this. And obviously as they went into orbit around it, taking images, they got very good pictures of the far side of the moon. You can see a couple of them there. And you can see, yes, it's very much uh, lacking in these uh, uh, Maria or Seas. But it did again, yet more conspiracies. We have this thing called the Shard and the Tower. Very fuzzy pictures, people claiming that they were alien influences or alien spy masters or something like that that was going on uh, because uh, we got these strange images uh, back, almost certainly artifacts or tricks of the light or something like that. <clears throat> then we're back again to another first by the Russians. Uh, this is the Zond 5 mission. So here we have a uh, 
that went off to nearly Mars. Uh, this one went around the back of the moon, uh, but this one actually managed to go right around the moon and come back. So uh, this was the first thing to actually go to the moon and come back and bring with it some passengers. So they took with it uh, two Russian tortoises, some mealworms, a few uh, wine flies, some bacteria, various uh, plants, seeds and other uh, living or close to living animals and plants and seeds, just to see what the environment was like. Because if you're going to potentially put astronauts uh, into the far side of the moon, uh, it would be best to check that you know it is a safe environment. They were pretty sure it was, but it's always better to check. So uh, they, they sent these two tortoises, which returned quite safely. And uh, other than losing a bit of weight, they were, they were fine, uh, survived and had all sorts of medical checks done on them. And all the other things seemed to show up too. So um, yeah, all safe, all, all uh, go for people to go to the, the moon and indeed to the far side. So now we're into the space race. And uh, you know, at this point, the uh, US are a long way behind the Russians. The Russians have got nearly all the uh, firsts that are going. So I don't know if anybody remembers Sputnik 1957. I can't say I do, I'm uh, not quite old enough for Sputnik, but that was the first satellite that went into orbit and really did shock uh, the Americans. The Russians could do such a thing. So that was the, the first ladder on the first, the first lunar probe. We've talked about Luna 1, the first uh, lunar contact, Luna 2, to actually touch down on the uh, moon. We also have, obviously, the first spaceman with Vostok 1 and Yuri Gagarin in 1961. First space woman, Vostok 6, 1963, with Valentina Tereshkova. First lunar soft landing, Luna 9. Uh, the first lunar satellite, Luna 10. So really, uh, the Americans have it all to do at this point, And the Apollo missions are what are going to bump them back into the first place. And uh, obviously, we know all the story of that. So uh, I'm not going to spend too long on the Apollo missions, except uh, for a just cover them briefly, but uh, where, where they do impact on the story of the far side of the moon. So unfortunately, it starts with tragedy with uh, Apollo 1 test flight, which wasn't actually called Apollo 1, but was renamed Apollo 1 uh, in light of the tragedy where these three astronauts, uh, Grissom, Chaffee and White, were burnt, uh, burnt to death, basically, on the launch pad. It wasn't even a attempt to launch a rocket into space. It was just a regular test of the capsule with a, a high pressure oxygen environment just to see if all the systems were working. So quite a lot of mistakes were made in this, that uh, a lot of the stuff within the Apollo capsule was at least fire resistant, but not necessarily fire resistant in a pure oxygen atmosphere under high pressure. So that was one of the errors with that. Uh, also, that they couldn't open the door very quickly uh, due to, uh, this was Gus Grissom, the guy on the left, uh, one of the Mercury probes, when that returned to Earth and splash landed, splashed down in the sea, um, through something that was never entirely explained completely, the, the door of his capsule blew off and uh, he had to get out very quickly before the capsule sunk. Uh, and nobody was quite sure whether it was something he'd done wrong, some malfunction or whatever, but they redesigned the door to not explosively blow off by accident because that was uh, very close to tragedy, that one. Unfortunately, that then led to his uh, tragic death in uh, the Apollo 1 uh, disaster. So uh, up to this point, they'd been doing quite a lot of testing on the Saturn uh, rockets that was going to culminate in the Saturn V launch, and you can see them there from uh, 1964 onwards. These are all unmanned tests, uh, the AS-101 up to the AS-204, which was where the tragedy occurred, where that was on the launch pad. They were going to, uh, they were planning to launch it at some later date, but uh, they obviously never got that far. They had to redesign the capsule in the light of the tragedy. 
Uh, and then they did restart the program quite quickly. So you can see there, January 27, 1967 was when uh, they had this disaster. By November 1967, they were back to uh, unmanned testing with Apollo 4 and 5 and 6 indeed. And then Apollo 7 was the first manned mission. So that was about a year and a half after this disaster. So very quick recovery really uh, from this to try and fulfill Kennedy's dream. So Apollo 7, first, uh, um, first all up test of the uh, Apollo space hardware with astronauts on board. So with the capsule, astronauts and the whole lot. So it's basically quite a straightforward mission uh, just to go into Earth orbit, test out the systems, see if they could um, do all they needed to do, that the staging worked and uh, life support worked and all that sort of stuff, and that they could return safely to Earth. So nothing that hadn't been done quite a few times before by this point. So that's Apollo 7. Apollo 8, uh, which I just about remember, uh, most audacious mission I can think of still sort of almost brings chills out. You had your very first test of the Apollo program, your first rocket with like three million separate parts that all have to work together to get you into uh, orbit. So what do you do with your second test? You send it off to the moon. So Apollo 8 launched and from there they went off to the moon. And obviously at this point, they were the first human beings to see the far side of the, uh, the moon. So the first three astronauts who managed to get around to the far side, to see the far side. Uh, this is the uh, simplified trajectory. They went there, they actually went into orbit around the moon and saw it several times and took this iconic photograph of the Earth rising as they came up from uh, the, the far side of the moon, seeing the Earth uh, rise up above the moon. Um, so Earthrise, this rather famous picture. If you want all the gory details, then uh, you, you can find this on the interweb somewhere, but uh, all, all the various uh, birds and whatever they had to do to get into uh, the position they needed to. But <clears throat> it does kind of take your breath away that uh, this is only the second time they've tried a rocket of this size and complexity into space, and they go all the way to the moon and back. Uh, the pressure was certainly on because of uh, uh, the space race, but uh, even so, I don't know whether we're, we're quite that uh, courageous these days. Although there is uh, obviously a launch tomorrow, it is tomorrow, isn't it? Wednesday, uh, two astronauts going back to the space station on a uh, SpaceX rocket. So that'd be worth watching. Just to sort of complete some of this, Apollo 9 was uh, another test of the uh, uh, systems to see if they could uh, get into Earth orbit, this time with a lunar module brought along with it. Now, OK, I'm going to try something a bit clever here. Uh, this could all go badly wrong. So I hope Chris is there to rescue me if it does. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And can you see me? Yeah, we got you. Yep, so I've got my Lego model of the Apollo uh, rockets here. So what uh, Apollo 9 did is this is where, can you see that? That's, that's where the uh, lunar module is. It sits in this bit for takeoff and this is where the astronauts sit up here. So when they, uh, when they get uh, out into orbit, where there's obviously no air resistance so you can remove this bearing, they have to undock from here, turn around and go and pick up the uh, the lunar module. So this is really what um, this this uh, procedure was all about. Right. See if I can get back to presenting uh, without any. Does that work? Am I, are you back to seeing Apollo Nine? Yes. Fabulous. Oh, there you are without a safety net. Well, I guess Chris is my safety net. So that's Apollo 9. They, they checked out that they could uh, do the docking, uh, retrieve the lunar module, do whatever was necessary, all within low Earth orbit, and then return. Uh, followed by Apollo 10. So this was the second 
group of astronauts to see the far side of the moon. They went off to the moon with uh, the command module and the lunar module. And this was a full dress rehearsal, obviously, for Apollo 11. They undocked the lunar module. They flew it down to within, I think, a small number of kilometers. I can't remember whether it was five or 50, but it, it was quite close to the surface of the, uh, the moon. And it was quite risky, I suspect, on NASA's part, which they, they thought of, because this is being flown by two test pilots who have flown sort of all manner of aircraft and taken all manner of risks throughout their career. And they are very gung-ho type people who are, you know, there because they have the right stuff. So you've got two of these astronauts descending down to the moon, and then they've got to stop and come back without actually landing. Uh, you've got to think that they might well have gone through their mind at some point to say, why don't we just go that extra few kilometers and just land there and be the first. So NASA were, uh, sort of canny enough to uh, not actually give them sufficient fuel to be able to do that. So they, they did go down quite close to the surface of the moon, then came back up and proved they could redock with the command module, return to Earth. And obviously, uh, the rest is history somewhat in that uh, Apollo 11 uh, did the whole uh, shebang and did land on the moon and did bring rocks back and all the rest of it and was not filmed in a Hollywood studio at all. Uh, so skating over a lot the rest of the Apollo missions, they've all now seen the far side of the moon. So uh, even Apollo 13, which didn't get to the moon, they did get to see the far side of the moon. So that's quite a lot of people who, well, a number of people have seen the far side of the moon by this point. We end up with Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions, obviously, Apollo 18, 19 and 20 were planned and even had uh, they even had landing sites picked out for some of them. But uh, continuing budget cuts meant uh, that uh, Apollo 20 was cancelled very soon on and 18 and 19 very soon after. So Apollo 17 was the last mission to get to the Earth, the last two people to walk on the moon 50 years ago today. Well, not today, 50 years ago now. Sorry, don't know why I said today. Uh, but uh, this one had a geologist, Harrison Smith, and he argued strongly that they should go to the far side of the moon, that they you know, visited the near side a number of times now, and they should go to the far side because it was clear from the imagery that there was something very different about the far side. So why not go and get some rocks from the far side? This would be a great final mission. They could go and land there. History shows that they didn't. They went to uh, the NASA knowing this was probably their last mission to the moon for a long while, uh, perhaps didn't realize quite how long, decided probably to play it safe. There was still some good science they could do on the near side, so they went with the near side and uh, they didn't go for the far side. So uh, what could have been? They could have been the people to touch down on the far side, but as it was, they do. Uh, this did lead to more conspiracies though, and this partly came about from the Apollo program that Perhaps the moon was hollow uh, and was actually a giant spaceship. And this has been around in one way or another for quite a few, uh, quite, quite a while. So uh, this was triggered in part by Apollo 12. So when the astronauts came back from Apollo 12 and redocked with the command module in orbit, they launched the lunar module back so it crashed into the moon so they could get some seismic data. They just placed seismometers on the moon and Apollo 11 had also placed seismometers so they could get some good seismic data. Uh, but uh, the phrase perhaps unfortunate was that the moon rang like a bell for an over an hour after Apollo 12 impacted into it. What rings like a bell? Only things that are hollow so the moon must therefore be hollow. So if you're trying to squash a, a conspiracy theory is this is not the best way to do it. Now, it does have a certain amount of uh, legitimacy in that Edmund Halley, or Haley, or whatever his name was, pronounced, he proposed the Earth was hollow in, 19, in 1692, based on some work by Isaac Newton. Uh, he got his calculation slightly off, and the only way you could get an Earth with the right sort of mass 
based on uh, his miscalculations, was to have it empty. So Edmund Halley proposed it was perhaps empty and was hollow. This was fairly shortly disproved, but I guess the idea was still there. H.G. Wells, in his novel, The First Men in the Moon, uh, he had these uh, heroes landing on the moon and then they went inside to meet the moon beings. So uh, it was there in uh, literature. And given some sort of credence by these two people from the Russian Science Academy, or Academy of Sciences, uh, these were two uh, scientists and they wrote a piece for, I think the journal was called Sputnik. I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, but it was kind of like uh, an old version of uh, the Reader's Digest. Well, I guess the Reader's Digest was probably around at the same time. But it was meant to promote uh, Russia and Russian ideals. So they published it in English and sent it around to lots of countries, showing how wonderful life was in the Soviet Union. And they wrote this article about it and saying the moon was probably hollow and probably a spaceship. And this had a certain sort of scientific cachet be, by, being presented by these two members of the Russian Academy of Science. They're not alone in this, obviously. There is a, there's this book you can buy to this day on Amazon, if you wish, Who Built the Moon? Uh, the Daily Mail gets, tells it it's uh, thought-provoking and uh, a dispassionate review shows that the moon must be hollow and built by an alien civilization. I did hover over the buy button for this, but decided in the end I wasn't going to give them my money. So uh, I, I've never actually read it. So if anybody does read it, do let me know if it's uh, worth reading. And of course, there is this idea that uh, no matter what you see, it may be no moon, it could well be a, an alien spaceship, thanks to Star Wars. Since the days of Apollo, we haven't done a lot with the moon. Uh, it's been visited it very occasionally and uh, infrequently because I guess they did quite a lot with the Apollo missions and it's quite hard to top that unless you're going back uh, with something slightly bigger. So of note only uh, a couple of missions recently have, have uh, sort of been of interest. One was this LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This was a high resolution mapping uh, satellite uh, so got there in 2009 and is still orbiting. So it, this has a very good uh, uh, mapping capability, has 100 meter resolution in its main mapping camera and has a half meter resolution uh, camera for taking pictures of interesting places. If you know there's a particularly interesting place, then you can get down to half a meter resolution, which is far better than you can do from anywhere else. Even the Hubble Space Telescope pointing at the moon wouldn't get this sort of resolution. So uh, this is been what's used for looking at the moon in detail and uh, this is uh, the Apollo 17 landing site viewed from the LRO. You can see there you have enough detail to see even the footprints of the astronauts and the tracks of the lunar rover and the obviously the descent stage and the lunar rover vehicle parking space and all these other things. So this is Further proof that uh, you know the, the Apollo missions were real and not filmed, but I guess it, it's not going to convince anybody who was a, a conspiracy theorist. They will always find a way to say, "Well, this is also clearly faked. This is just what NASA would expect." But uh, it does. This lunar reconnaissance orbiter now has given us the best maps of the far side of the moon. So now we have some pretty good maps of the far side of the moon, which uh, I'll just show you here. So this is. Uh, top to bottom picture of the far side of the moon and you can see really in the way of this maria or oceans oceans of storms and sea of tranquility and all that sort of thing are just not visible here so that's uh, uh something that we're still not quite sure of so this is almost bringing us up to date uh, there's one last sort of part of this Changi 4, this is the spy, no, Chinese Space Agency. They sent a mission Changi 3 that landed on the near side and had a lunar rover. And Changi 4, they sent to the far side of the moon and landed there with, again, with a rover. Conspiracies are still around though. The Daily Express was not uh, completely happy that this uh, 
was the case and uh, are still not completely convinced. Uh, just, to, oh, just to illustrate this a little, here's a bit of folklore from China. So this is where the names of this uh, mission come from. Changi and the Magpie Bridge is this uh, folklore. So Changi is the lady you can perhaps see in these uh, Chinese images. You can also see a rabbit. They see a rabbit on the moon with a pestle of mortar there who is making potions. Where we see a man in the moon, they see a rabbit in the moon. Uh, you can see almost anything you like in the moon, obviously. Uh, so the story goes, uh, if you want the story, that uh, China was being ravaged by a big drought. And this drought was caused by 10 suns being visible in the night, in the day sky rather. And this was giving them a large drought. So nine extra suns beaming down on the earth, drying up all the water. So what do you do with a situation like that? You obviously get a famous hunter, and here he is called Yi. Uh, you get him with a bow and arrow and send him off and he goes off and shoots down nine of these suns. So uh, obviously uh, based in solid science already, but uh, for his efforts he is rewarded, obviously saving the country from drought. He is given a potion produced I think by the rabbit on the moon if I follow the story correctly. So here's the potion and this uh, grants the person who drinks it uh, immortal life so they will live forever. So Yi takes this potion and he's in two minds about what to do with the potion. Should he drink it and live forever or not? Because uh, you know, he has a wife, uh, Chang'e, that he is obviously very much in love with because that's how stories go. And does he want to you know, live forever and see his wife die and all that sort of thing? Or should he wait a while and think it over? So like a lot of men, I guess he... Uh, punts it into the future and puts it on a shelf in his house and goes off and does whatever a superhero with a bow and arrow does. Uh, so it's sitting there on the shelf. Uh, but he uh, has um, uh, he has a sort of understudy uh, called uh, Peng Mang, I think it is. Can't, can't remember offhand. Uh, but anyway, he, he decides he is not troubled by the uh, ethics of the situation and he is quite willing to live forever. So he breaks into their house and goes to grab this potion off the shelf. Uh, Changi sees him doing this and races there, gets there first and defeats it, defeats him stealing the potion by drinking it very quickly herself. So she becomes immortal and Yi doesn't because she's drunk the potion. And a side effect of drinking the potion is that you now have to go to the moon and live there forever. So she goes and lives forever on the moon. Yi is stuck on Earth and they never get to see each other again. Very sad. And uh, the rabbit, as far as I know, carries on making potions on the moon. But the gods are luckily just a little on their side. So they decide every once in a while, well, once a year, in fact, they will make a bridge between the Earth and the moon and uh, Yi can walk across the bridge and meet up with Chang'e and they can meet once a year to say hello or something or say, did you switch the oven off or whatever it is and get to meet each other. So uh, that's, that's where some of this comes from. And this is reflected somewhat in their, uh, in their space mission. So uh, they have this spaceship uh, satellite going around the L2 position that we talked about quite a while back. And this is called Quayo, the Magpie Bridge. So this is the connection between the Earth and the Moon that allows uh, Changi on the, the far side of the Moon to talk to the Earth through this Magpie Bridge. And uh, the lander on the Moon is called uh, uh, U2, yes, U2, Y-U-T-U, and is known as the Jade Rabbit. So that is the rabbit on the Moon. So you can see where all these things come from, hopefully. You know far more about uh, Chinese mythology than you probably uh, felt you needed to know. So this is the uh, uh, lander that's landed on the far side of the moon. The only thing so far to soft land on the far side of the moon uh, with its rover that's uh, got around to exploring it. Uh, and here are some pictures from the Chinese Space Agency. 
So this is the rover that's moved off uh, and uh, driven around a little bit, looking somewhat like Sojourner, I, I think. Uh, has uh, a drill capability so it can drill into the uh, the rocks and take samples. Uh, here we see it having made its way off and uh, taking a not quite a healthy but a, a parity or something of uh, its lander on the moon. So this is where we've been to on the near side you can see uh, there Changi 3 at the top on the left hand side on the near side and on the far side there's only one mission that we know of that soft landed there uh, with the possible exception of the uh, early American probe that might have crash landed but we've no idea where. The Chang'e 4 made a very successful landing and despite the Daily Mail and uh, Express and whatever we do have imagery of it from lower lunar orbit from the LRO with its high precision camera there we see uh, uh, Chang'e and U2 uh, were picked out by their shadows on the uh, far side of the moon. And it's actually done some reasonable science. We've got a nature paper here of uh, initial spectroscopic material. And they are trying to understand why the far side of the moon is so different to the near side. And I haven't looked more recently, but up till certainly December last year, it was still trogging across the far side of the moon. So because you get uh, 14 days of night, 14 days of uh, day on the moon as it uh, does its dance around the earth, uh, this U2 shuts down over the night and then wakes up when the, uh, the sun is back in the sky, charges up its solar panels and then it tr trundles off for a bit of a explore around and then it shuts down again overnight. And you know, it's done quite well there. So since January 2019 to December 2019, it's made quite a lot of uh, progress. <clears throat> but it does seem, <coughs> excuse me, I should have brought a drink with me as well as some cake. Uh, it does seem it's now almost open season on the moon. We've had quite a number of people going back to the moon. So uh, the Indian Space Agency sent Chandrayaan 2 uh, with its Vikram lander to go and land on the moon. Uh, and also had a rover. Unfortunately, this one failed and crashed into the moon. It got very close and very close to landing safely, but they lost control of it uh, in the last few kilometers. And instead of soft landing, it uh, did uh, quite, a, quite a hard landing and uh, unfortunately nothing survived. Uh, Israel also sent a Bereshit spacecraft to land on the moon. Uh, this one also failed, but also got very close to, to landing. So if both of these countries can uh, make serious attempts at getting to the moon, and India is having a second go with um, Chandrayaan-3, they've already got that uh, underway. So it does seem it's now a much better time to go back to the moon. It's getting much easier and much easier to get into space. So uh, now is the time. And there's still quite a few questions to be answered. You know, firstly, I've uh, hinted at you know, why is the near side and the far side so different? You can see the near side there, very covered in these uh, volcanic outflows, making these seas, which the near side isn't. You might think that perhaps this is caused by the tidal locking and the Earth stopping impacts by um, uh, asteroids into it, but it really doesn't block very much of the moon's surface. It's only four square degrees covered. Uh, from where the moon is, the Earth is covering, so it, it really doesn't block very much. Uh, what we do know is that the crust of the moon is much thicker on the far side, so this would perhaps explain why you can get vulcan volcanism on the near side and not on the far side, but unfortunately it just makes the problem just one stage worse in that now why do, why do we think the far side is thicker than the near side? We don't really have any clue. There are a few scientific papers on this, but nobody has really come down to a good uh, answer to this. Uh, so perhaps to sum up the answer, was it a home for aliens? Almost certainly, probably not. Uh, we have found no evidence of aliens on the near side or the far side. So uh, um, nothing has shown up as yet. We might well have to wait for a 2001 Stanley Kubrick-like uh, unveiling of 
uh, magnetic anomalies to, to find out uh, if it truly is devoid of aliens. But what can we do in the future? And I have to emphasize this, this is my speculation and uh, this, this, this is just what I think or what I would like to happen. It, it may not uh, even come to pass. But I, I would think colonization, if we're going to go out into outer space, I think the moon is a perfect place to test out a lot of ideas. Uh, Mars is <clears throat> certainly a place you could perhaps establish a colony on it. But the moon is so much easier and closer to get to. It's only, you know, it took the astronauts three days to get to the moon. So it's pretty easy to get there and to get back from. So it's much easier to send, um, you know, quick supply ships and other things to the moon. It's something that uh, we can try out a lot of our ideas. If you're going to live on a, a foreign planet, Mars has a lot of the same problems as the moon. You know, the Mars does have a thin atmosphere, but it's not really you know, for all the good it does it's not that that good uh it's it's uh, not really helping you very much uh it doesn't even block cosmic rays and things like that so you have to take account of all those things on the moon and the other thing is that if you can do something sensible on the moon this graph just shows you how much energy you need to get off three different bodies and the amount of energy you need to get off the earth is colossal compared to the amount of energy you need to get off the moon. Uh, if you think back to the tiny size of the uh, lunar lander, that had sufficient energy to get off the moon and back into orbit and return um, largely to the to the Earth. So a tiny amount of energy required to get stuff off the moon. So if you can do anything sensible on the moon, if you can make things, you can manufacture things, you can mine the moon for helium-3 and other things that have been proposed, then it's pretty easy to get stuff back from the moon to the Earth compared to getting from the Earth to the moon. And as you can see there, Mars is somewhere in between. A lot easier to get off Mars than the Earth, uh, but it's not quite as easy as the moon. So as an astronomer, the moon would be a perfect place for telescopes, particularly the far side. You're continually blocked from any light pollution and radio pollution from the earth because you've got this large body of the earth in between so you can certainly uh, if you can set up telescopes that would be a good place to do it there was going to be a uh, royal astronomical society special working group on uh, a far side telescope that was due to be held i think in march this year but obviously that got cancelled with uh, more pressing needs so we didn't have that meeting uh, but that was a sort of feasibility study to see what we could do on these days. Uh, if any of you like uh, science fiction, Arthur C. Clarke wrote an excellent book called uh, Earthlight, where there's a group of astronomers living on the moon, and pretty much all serious astronomy has moved at that point to the moon because of its fine position. So telescopes on the far side of the moon. <laughs> that's my uh, That's my plug. That's what I think we should do. Uh, and I say it's just so much easier to get stuff to and from the moon than it is to get to Mars. So with that, that ends the, the talk for today. I hope you found at least some of that uh, interesting. And uh, in case you have any questions, um, I'm happy to have a go at them. Whether uh, I'm capable of answering them or not, uh, we shall see.